Good morning. <laughs> you are in the Opportunities in Rural Communities in Search of Their Own Solutions session. My name is Lisa Nyans Heine, and I'm a managing director on the school leadership team at Teach for America, and I run the Rural School Leadership Academy and Rural Principal Fellowship um, here at our organization, and I really want to thank you for coming to this session. We are going to get started um, without any further ado because we have a packed panel and schedule for you this morning. I want to take the opportunity to introduce our moderator, Will Nash, who's the executive director of Teach for America Appalachia. Will Nash grew up in rural Kentucky before attending the University of Kentucky where he majored in political science and economics. But after graduation, Will joined Teach for America's South Louisiana Corps and taught middle school at Capitol Middle School. In 2008, Will joined TFA's staff as a recruitment director in Louisiana and Texas and began lobbying internally at Teach for America for attention to be paid for the issues in our rural communities and schools. Today, Will is in his sixth year as the founder and executive director of Teach for America Appalachia. TFA continues to be, or Will continues to be known in Teach for America as a fierce rural advocate, and he has consistently advocated for policies that will accelerate TFA's impact in rural communities and an attention to the unique needs of our rural schools. Please help me welcome Will to the stage. Thank you. It is great to be here with you all. Uh, many rural advocates and supporters in the room, uh, and I'm excited to dive into this topic with you all. You know, education in rural communities is a topic that has historically received uh, a little less of the spotlight and far less of the resources than educational equity uh, and excellence in urban areas. Uh, though some of the challenges of rural communities are similar to those in urban areas, many are unique to the rural context and require their own thought, attention, and solutions. Today we're going to hear from a panel of people uh, interested in um, educational equity and excellence in rural communities and working toward creating just that uh, in several different ways. You'll also have ample opportunity to ask questions. Uh, there should have been a note card on your seat when you walked in, so if you think of something uh, you'd like to ask a panelist, feel free to write it on the note card and include your name. Uh, and then at a certain time, in about 45 minutes, we'll ask you to hold those up and we'll come around and collect them and begin fielding your own questions. Uh, to begin, though, we want to hear from educators who are currently working daily in their rural communities uh, with students and families um, and those who are experiencing both triumphs and challenges uh, firsthand. So I'd like to welcome Blake Thompson and Lauren Carrier to the stage uh, to situate us in the rural context. And let me tell you just a little bit about Blake and Lauren before they come up. Blake uh, graduated from Elon University, class of 2013. Uh, he is a 2013 core member, was a 2013 core member in Alabama, uh, where he taught um, seventh and eighth grade history and now teaches ninth and 11th grade history. Uh, he is also the head varsity football and baseball coaches. So Blake has his hands full. Uh, Dr. Lauren Carrier uh, joins us today from the Ajo Schools of Arizona uh, in the midst of the breath breathtaking uh, Sonoran Desert. She's honored to serve on a campus of 442 students, grades pre-K to 12, 40 miles north of the U.S.-Mexico border, just off the Tejano Otham Nation. Dr. Carrier is thrilled with the diversity of cultures in Ajo schools, both students and staff. She earned her BA in biology from Arcadia University and her master's in student development administration and doctoral degree in education leadership from Seattle University. She is a 2008 Phoenix alum uh, and also took part in our real rural principal fellowship. So I'd like to welcome Blake and Lauren to the stage. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm honored to offer a glimpse, a snapshot, of our work with students, staff, and the community in Ajo, Arizona. Our tiny town, fondly referred to as being in the middle of nowhere, is 43 miles north of the U.S.-Mexico border, 
10 minutes west of the Tahana Atham Nation and set in the midst of the stunning Sonoran Desert. This is the home of coyotes and bobcats, javelinas and saguaros, rattlesnakes and scorpions. At night, my eyes feast on the stars and the planets. They're astonishing in their brightness. In the midst of this beauty stands the now defunct New Cornelia Mine, a gaping hole where a mountain once stood. The slag heap sits across from our campus. The mine closed in 85. I want our students to create something beautiful of their lives, something different than the slag heap. I view the 450 children in our pre-K to grade 12 school as possessing potential to shine brightly. Many of our scholars have not had the opportunity to do so. For the most part, our children are students of color, Latino, Native, Asian, and Anglo. Our Asian students are sons and daughters of our teachers from the Philippines. Of 28 teachers, 17 are international, hailing from the Philippines, Jamaica, and Colombia. Our teachers from far-flung areas bring commitment and an incredible work ethic. They want the best for our students. It's a joy to work in such an international community. We completed staffing for the current 2015-2016 academic year just two weeks ago. We search internationally and across the U.S. to bring excellent teachers willing to work for meager pay. Depending upon what statistic is quoted, Arizona schools and per pupil spending allocations rank 48th, 49th, or 50th in the country with resulting faltering salaries for educators. With the help of school improvement grant funding, we raised the graduation rate from 71% to 86%, raised the college acceptance and college going rate, and opened doors of opportunities for our children and families. In 2011, not one student applied to a four-year college. In 2014, 57% of our students were admitted to baccalaureate colleges and universities. Is it enough? No. Let me tell you the story of one family. It's a story in contrast, the story of three children. In 2012, I watched as the petite National Honor Society president stood on a paint can at the podium in the auditorium to welcome new NHS members. She graduated with a 4.0, scholarships to the University of Arizona, Arizona State, and other institutions. We were shocked at the level of loans included in her financial aid package. How would she repay them? She never went to college. She still lives in Ajo and works at the local flower shop. Fast forward to 2014, when her brother graduated from high school. He too was accepted to a number of universities. He too had scholarships. He chose the University of Arizona and became first in his family to attend college. He left Ajo planning to major in business at the U of A. At Thanksgiving, he returned stating he wanted to teach. That's just what Ajo needs. Our students of color succeeding and choosing to teach and lead at home. What about the third child? This younger sister is bright. She's energetic. I want her to choose the path of her brother. I want her to choose college. Just as our students and families have dreams for their children, I too have dreams for Ajo. At this nexus of cultural diversity, I want to see an international baccalaureate program take shape. I want our newly formed connections with Border Patrol and Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument to open doors for our children and their families. I want our Red Raider scholars ready to leave the nest, to leave the relative safety of Ajo, head out for specialized training, return to build our community, and make their families proud. There's so much more. This is but a brief glimpse of our work, our dreams, our challenges in staffing and funding. I'm a rural school leader inspired by possibility, by beauty, and by our growing international community. I'm proud to serve in Ajo, where I strive to honor and build our community for future generations. Thank you. Marion, Alabama. 
home of the Civil Rights Movement, Jimmy Lee Jackson, Albert Turner Sr., Coretta Scott King. Now today, I, I could tell you about the rich history in the Deep South of that Civil Rights Movement, but it wouldn't be nearly as authentic from my point of view. So I thought to tell you about something I know best, the Francis Marion football team. These past few years have been some of great triumph, but also some of heartbreaking choices. I'll start with those heartbreaking choices. The choices of two young black men, student athletes of mine, led them to see their lives flash before them. As they had nothing to do, no organized sport to play in, no community center to play ball in, mischief ensued. Their idea to rob and assault a local store clerk owner is an issue that I deal with until this day. Did they understand the severity of the situation then? I don't think so. Did they understand when those bullets smoothly missed both of them as they were sprinting past the store? They didn't get it. Did they get it that evening when they saw their parents in tears and myself in tears? I still don't think they got it. What about when their, their wrists and their ankles were shackled that same evening? Did they understand then? No. It took them three weeks in a detention center over the Christmas holiday for them to realize that that was not the life that they wanted to live. So, together, we set on a journey through a game that I love dearly, football. Let me take you back to 2013, when I first arrived at Francis Marion. I was the assistant coach. In that season, we lost 19 out of 25 players due to insufficient grades. Take you to the next year, 2014, my first season as head coach. We won a measly two games. This past year, my second year as head coach, we set out on a journey to instill a sense of pride, respect, and commitment through this game of football. This past year, in 2015, the Francis Marion football team earned their first, excuse me, not their first, earned a playoff berth for the first time in 15 years. Not to mention, we finished this season with a team GPA of a 2.95, along with multiple community service events. We accomplished this feat one day at a time through daily study hall, weekend weightlifting sessions, opening my home for meals. No matter how good the meals were, that's not as important. <laughs> and college visits on, on weekends. The dismay and the sadness that plagued the community for two young men turned into a place of hope, triumph, and resiliency for a town of people after we earned that playoff berth. Those two young men who were nearly shot due to a lack of opportunity in the community, a lack of internal self-respect, and an overall lack of discipline were the leaders on this past year's team. That spark that was ignited by those two young men, along with 28 others, is fueling motivation, not just for our team, but for our school at large, through academic achievement and an overall more positive school culture. That triumph is the power of us, doing our part as leaders. We, together, are in the business of saving lives. We, together, are in the business of transforming communities. We, together, are in the business of ensuring our kids have the best opportunities to succeed. 
And I know that my story isn't alone because you all are in the same business as I. So now, as we continue to work at Francis Marion, and you continue to work maybe in eastern North Carolina, South Dakota, Gallup, New Mexico, maybe it just starts with the football team, a dance line, a debate team, a science club, or whatever that you can bring to the table. That huge change starts with none other than you. It's our job to continue to hustle, inspire, face the challenges, and inspire our children to overcome those same challenges. Now, I may not have seen a community change at large, but what I have seen is a spark in those two young men, a spark in our school, a spark in our community. That one spark due to success on the football field, in the classroom, in the community, in the hallways, has translated into an overall sense of pride for our whole community. One battle fought by two young men has turned into a monumental win for our community by instilling again a sense of pride and hope in Marion, Alabama. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren and Blake. Uh, at this point, I want to transition to our panel, uh, the reason that many of you came today. Uh, first, I want to thank the J.A. and Katherine Albertson Foundation for underwriting our panel today, uh, as well as some of our work in Idaho and other rural initiatives across the country, uh, one of which you can read about uh, from the flyer on your chair. There will also be some additional information at the back of the room should you want to learn more about the Albertson Foundation's initiatives. I want to take a second to introduce our panelists, a very esteemed group of professionals working across many different rural communities. Uh, and I'll begin with Dr. Kathy Trimble. If you want to give a little wave, Dr. Trimble. Uh, Dr. Trimble was born and raised and educated in rural Marion, Alabama. After graduating from, thank you, from the University of West Alabama, um, or excuse me, she got her undergraduate master's and administrative certificate uh, from the University of West Alabama and her doctorate degree in educational leadership from Nova Southeastern University. Her dissertation was Developing an, uh, an Identification Process and Intervention Plan for Potential Dropouts. And her, doc her dissertation has evolved into a su successful program at Francis Marion High where the graduation rate continues to be above 90% annually. She has spent her entire... <laughs> Dr. Trimble has spent her entire educational career working in the Perry County school system at her high school alma mater. One of her mo main focus areas, she said, is hiring Teach for America Corps members in an effort to provide her students with enthusiastic, extraordinary educators working to expose and connect rural students to a global world. We're happy to have Dr. Trimble. <laughs> Dr. Luzelma Canales joins us uh, as the executive director for RGV Focus in collaboration with Educate Texas. Prior to joining Educate Texas, Dr. Canale served as, community and, as a community college and university administrator with over 25 years of experience. During her time in higher ed, it is fair to say, looking at this list, she managed everything. Uh, Dr. Canale sold a Bachelor's of Business Administration from Pan American University and a Master's of Business Administration from the University of Texas Pan American and a Doctorate of Philosophy and Human Resource Development from Texas A&M University College Station, which you have to follow with Gigum, <laughs> Dr. Canales. Dr. Ray Spain, uh, thank you. Dr. Spain was appointed by the Board of Education in August 2003 as Superintendent of Warren County Schools. I'm probably supposed to click soon. Nope. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Spain is a Virginia Beach native. He began his career as a teacher's aide in Halifax County, North Carolina. He served as a classroom teacher and is the coordinator for several education-related programs before becoming a principal. His first principal position was in Jackson Community School in Jackson, North Carolina, where he organized an alternative high school for dropouts and at-risk students. As Warren County Superintendent, Dr. Spain has supported technology to enhance teaching for the instructional staff um, 
He has been instrumental in creating a system of school choice within the school district and provided increased opportunities for students to take college courses while in high school. Dr. Spain, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Tammy Sutton is the founder and executive director of KIPP, uh, Eastern North Carolina Public Schools, which includes KIPP Gaston College Prep, KIPP Halifax College Prep, and KIPP Durham College Prep. In 2001, Tammy co-founded the region's flagship school, Kip Gaston College Prep's middle school, where she served as the co-principal and taught English, history, and pre-algebra. In 2003, Tammy was the recipient of the Kinder Excellence in Teaching Award. In 2005, she founded Gaston College Prep's high school, where 100% of the first six senior classes have earned acceptance to a four-year college or university, and over 80% of these students will be first-generation college graduates. I don't know if you've heard of a woman named Wendy Kopp, but you can read more about Tammy in Wendy's books, One Day All Children and A Chance to Make History. We're glad to have you, Tammy. Thanks for joining us. Sanford Johnson is a Starkville, Mississippi native and 2003 Teach for America alum from the Mississippi Delta. As a core member, as a core member, Sanford taught in Clarksdale and Helena. He holds degrees from Auburn University and the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service. After co-founding Mississippi First in 2008 with Rachel Cantor, Sanford has primarily worked on the organization's advocacy and outreach efforts. He has coordinated the school district advocacy strategy for the Creating Healthy and Responsible Teens Sex Ed Initiative. He served as a reviewer for the Mississippi Department of Education's School Improvement Grants and has trained teachers with the Mississippi State uh, Department of Health for over three years. Along with his work with Mississippi First, Sanford is also a member of the Mississippi Advisory Council to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and the William Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation. We're glad to have you, Sanford. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, upon graduating from Georgetown University, Tom Torkelson, uh, with a degree in economics in 1997, joined Teach for America and taught fourth grade in Donna, Texas for three years, after, after which he successfully launched Idea Academy in 2000, serving as the first board president and founding principal. At 24 years of age, Tom was then Texas' youngest ever charter school founder. He has since led the replication efforts of the original school, and there are now 24,000 students enrolled in 44 schools across the Rio Grande Valley, Austin, and San Antonio. The mission of IDEA Public Schools is to prepare students from underserved communities for success in college and citizenship. IDEA's graduates are persisting in graduating from college at rates six times that of other low-income students. And in 2015, the U.S. News & World Report ranked all six of IDEA's eligible high schools in the top 500 nationwide and top 60 in Texas. Tom is often called upon to provide expert testimony to state and local officials on issues of education policy and school choice. Most recently, he participated, is participating in the Broad Fellowship and was a TEDx McAllen speaker. Help me welcome Tom Torkelson. It's nothing like reading others' bios that make you feel inadequate in life. <laughs> I want to dive in with a question for all of you. There are a lot of barriers and limitations within rural communities, but there are also unbelievable assets and unique strengths to each of those communities. Tell me about one strength in your community that keeps you fueled to continue to work for that community. Dive right in. Take a stab, Evan. I think one of the, we often think about rural communities having a lot of weaknesses and not having a lot of resources. Uh, but sometimes I think it's important to recognize what we do have. Uh, we have a, in rural communities, a very strong connection with land, with family, and with communities. I really didn't realize this until about uh, three or four years ago when we uh, began some work on a strategic plan. And we took about 25 members of our community, including uh, business people, parents, and even some students, and we got away for about three days to really work on this, and we developed a mission statement. And I think that mission statement says so much about the community, but I didn't realize how much of an investment and how strong folks felt about Warren County. Now, I'm not a resident of Warren County, uh, but I certainly uh, admire the folks who are there. Let me just read a few lines from the mission statement. 
And it says a lot in this about our county and about how folks feel about our county. Uh, the mission of Warren County Schools, located in a close-knit rural communities with natural and cultural resources in which children grow and blossom, is to educate students for the future by providing innovative school choices that ensures that all will become globally competitive productive citizens and who have acquired critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and leadership skill. And then it goes on to express how that happens. But, uh, but that is one of the strongest things we've got, I think, in our community is, is that feeling. And regardless what folks think, people choose to live in rural communities. That's where they want to be and for good reasons. I think of the asset that really stands out to me are the people in a lot of our rural communities. When I think about the people in Clarksdale and other places in the Mississippi Delta, those are the people that are impacted. And whenever we get a policy win or whenever we do hard work, we can see the people who are affected. Um, we are doing a study right now, testing in the state of Mississippi, and we had to interview teachers in several different districts. And one of the teachers that I got to uh, uh, interview was actually one of my star students when I was a core member. So that's a win. Like, Lashar Ramsey is a win. And uh, two weeks ago, I was at the Capitol, and uh, we were having our school choice uh, rally. But one of the things I got to do was uh, teach how Bill becomes a law to a group of 75 fifth graders from, a, uh, from the Midtown Charter School. And those students were at that school. They were getting that opportunity because we got a charter law passed in 2013. So those are students, like that's the, that's the fruit right there. So I often think about the people in every community, like these are, like the communities that we work in, like the, yes, they're under-resourced, yes, they, there's, a, there's a lot of things that they're lacking, but these are still the communities where within a one hour radius, we produce Sam Cooke, we produce Fannie Lou Hamer, we produce Morgan Freeman. So there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of great talent that comes from there, and what we realize is that as we continue to provide opportunities, there'll be more Lasharas, there'll be more famous people, there'll be more successful people, so. Um, buenos dias, good morning. I, I think you're going to hear like a broken record, right? And it is the people. And I was born in a little town of 1,300 people. Um, and we chose to live there, you know? And we migrated up to Washington and Oregon and chose to come back every, uh, you know, following the migrant track. I do think that there's a lot of myths about the people in rural communities, you know, especially Latino families. You know, their Latino families don't want their kids to go to college. Well, research disproves every single myth that you hear. You know, the number one predictor and reason that students give, Latino students give, of why they go to college is parental influence. Now, we mistake the, the, the lack of the ability to knowing how to get them there as parents not wanting. And I think it, 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 it's really, really important for those in the front line working with students, and this is what we're trying to change, the culture and the myths that are out there, is those are your greatest champions in rural communities for kids to do well, because everybody knows everybody, right? And so all you have to do is go pull grandma or go you know, pull the cousin or something. So the people are your greatest assets, and you should consider them that. Um, the one thing is that you're looking at first generation many times in rural communities, not only college going, but high school completers. And so it's really important to keep in mind that although that is your greatest asset, you also have to minimize the myths and, and go into those communities with open minds and open hearts. Thanks, Ms. Selma. Ms. Selma and I are neighbors, and her son teaches in one of our schools, so <laughs> it's always great to see a fellow Rio Grande Valley up here on, in, in the big city of Washington, D.C. And I mean, I would add to what Lucelma says. In the RGV, we were the site about a year and a half ago of a wave of unaccompanied minors crossing the border. And the level of vitriol and rhetoric that was being directed at the citizens of the RGV, as well as these young people who were coming over, was astonishing. But I was daily surprised and amazed and inspired by the generosity of our community. And I think that what the people of the RGV showed is that um, to all the politicians out there, uh, particularly on one side of the aisle who seem to be vilifying recent immigrants, I, I just, I, I think our students show that uh, they are as American as anybody else could possibly be. They learn English in our schools, they pray in our churches, they worship in our, I mean, they, they pledge allegiance to our flag, they go to our movies, they sing our songs, they 
cheer for our Dallas Cowboys and our San Antonio Spurs. All they want to do is be recognized by the country that many of them actually choose to enlist in the armed forces and fight and die for our country. They simply want a little bit of recognition of their humanity and their rights and their contributions to our society. So I feel like when I look at the tens of thousands of students across the RGV, I see a lot of hopeful stories and proof points that we really can shift the debate and the narrative and the language about what it means to be an immigrant, whether legal or illegal, in this nation. Along with talking about the people, that's one of the assets within the community. Also, those people who are there who made long-term commitments. Long-term commitments, as she's pointed out, those grandparents who are there, even within the school. I think one of the biggest assets in, in our community, or for myself, is being there and being there for a long period of time. You can build those personal relationships that span generations. I've had the opportunity to coach and teach children and now I am teaching their children. So with that, you can build that trust with those parents. So those parents can come and say, even if I don't know the solutions, I trust her or I trust the school. I trust those individuals to help you make those right decisions. You can see these people in, the gro in our one grocery store that we have or in the local restaurant or at church. And you can talk to those parents about those children and have a conversation with them, not just about them, but about their progress and about the goals that you have for it and with them. So you're building a partnership. So partnerships are built, and that's one thing about rural schools, because we are lacking, we're constantly having to build. And building partnerships, which provides for students, is very, very important in rural areas. Dave said it, it's students and families. Great, thank you. So uh, there are attendees here, many of whom who live in rural communities, uh, some of whom, likely a minority, who live in rural communities with charter schools others who live in rural communities without charter schools, and it might be hard to visualize what a charter network would look like in their rural community. Tom, can you talk a little bit? I idea started in the valley. Its focus was the valley and very rural for many of the, the early years. Can you talk about some of the, the greatest challenges you faced during that startup phase, and what can others who seek to bring charter schools to rural communities learn from what you learned starting idea? Yeah, I mean, and first, I mean, let me just sort of put out there, I think that the rural context, I mean, it's really not monolithic. What Tammy is experiencing in her schools and her community, it's very different from the RGV. I mean, we have, um, there's, there's, you know, a million people in the two counties of Hidalgo and Cameron County. We're not an urban environment. We're not suburban. I, I don't know where we fall in that whole spectrum, but um, we are kind of a semi-rural community. I think one of the biggest challenges that we had in the beginning was just lack of access to financial capital. And when I saw these remarkable charter networks being launched in the late 90s, and people were just raising hand over fist in money. And I thought, oh my, like, like, how are people raising a million dollars a year? That just seems impossible to me. And that really, I feel like that resource constraint really drove us to innovate around our program model to ensure that it was really um, financially sustainable around our people model. I mean, we have a tiny Teach for America region that unfortunately is shrinking by the year with the most recent trends nationally for Teach for America. And it's just meant that we've also had from a human capital perspective to have a really specific strategy of, of recruiting people who we want to start and continue and retire from their career at Idea Public Schools. Um, and then I would say that, you know, the other thing, um, all of us at Idea Public Schools who are teaching, who are principals, who are leading the network, um, it's not just that our schools are the best schools for other people's children. I mean, they're also the best schools for our kids. I mean, all of us have our children. I mean, I've got two of my three kids. The third one's not quite old enough yet. They, they, they all attend our schools. And I feel like that's been remarkable to really experience the good and sometimes the not so great things. My, what my wife is in the audience and we continually have conversations about, you know, where we just actually don't feel like our schools are rigorous enough for our children. And what does that mean for the other tens of thousands of students in our network? So, um, yeah, I think that the resource constraint in terms of financial resources and human capital just really caused us to, um, to attack the challenge from a very different perspective. And the final thing I'll add is about four years ago when we chose to go to Austin, um, I, I mean, again, it, it just the, the rhetoric in the Austin American Statesman, this is the most liberal paper in the most liberal city in a very red state of Texas. 
I, I mean, the way that they were talking about uh, a bunch of us, you know, redneck hooligans, you know, from the RGV, from the border region, coming up to Austin to launch schools, and what could we possibly teach, you know, this community, this city. Um, to me, I just took a lot of pride uh, being from the RGV, having our network from the Rio Grande Valley, actually showing that there are beautiful, wonderful things worth replicating that are coming out of rural communities. And it's not that we always have to look at bigger cities or more wealthy areas to find our solutions, but we actually have a lot of strength within um, our people and our communities to create the solutions that, that we need. Sure, so on the, on the topic of the constrained resources, specifically financial resources, can you get even more practical? So because you know, the valley is a lot like Appalachia, the low wealth capacity, not a lot of people who can write six or seven figure checks, what were some of the strategies you employed to overcome that specific challenge? Well, I mean, I think something, you know, very specifically, back before blended learning was fashionable, um, we found a way for about one-fourth of the day for our students to be in multi-age, uh, big rooms with very few adults um, on adaptive technology so that we could actually push the cost structure down so that we could pay fewer teachers a lot more um, to ensure that we really were getting the absolute best talent. And that never would have happened if we would have had a huge cash reserve or lots of donations. It, 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 it did create, um, I think, the, the, the resource scarcity pushed us to try to find a way to, to you know, overcome you know, in spite of that. Sure. So I, I want to bring Tammy in on this then. You know, we often live in a world in education reform of binaries, uh, sometimes false binaries, sometimes. Um, let me make two statements, and I'd love your reaction to it. So Kip Gaston is producing results that far exceed the achievement results of Northampton County schools. Kip Gaston is also making it harder for Gaston public schools to achieve such results by making already scarce resources more scarce. Do you agree with that, that set of statements? I think it's a great question to ask in this room first, because I think as champions of rural education, we can help shift that paradigm. So it's so easy, I think, to ask the question about competing interests as opposed to collective interests. I think it's really easy to talk about competition and much harder to talk about collaboration. And I think in all the communities in which we represent and this room represents, the problems in rural education are immense and it's going to take all of us, whether it is traditional public school, a charter school, an early college school, to say, let's all change the conversation between charters, traditional, to kids. All of us want the absolute best for the kids in the communities we serve. And I think when we can get away from the divisive conversation to the collective conversation, that's going to change that outcome. Um, with resources in a, in a community, whether that's rural or whether that's urban, absolutely in the sense that you know, the greatest resource is students. And, and students have the choice to attend a school that they want it and families do as well and part of our mission is not just to educate our kids so that they will be successful in college but the other two really important part of our mission statements is to make sure that we're working to strengthen our collective community and to continue to fight against the injustices that are there and so building schools and having staff and kids say we want to make sure that the education we're, we're, we're striving and empowering ourselves with is going to enable us to make the shared community a better place. The brothers and sisters and cousins of the students in our school attend the local public schools. Like, we don't want the statistic to talk about how we're outperforming. We want to talk about how the statistic has helped raising the educational outcomes for all students because that's when all of us will know that the true value add extends beyond the walls of our school but across across the community. So I think the question you asked, while I understand it, I think all of us can help to say, how can we start to be bridges between those, particularly with the Teach for America Network, and there's so many people who are, who are on both sides of, of those schools to say, how can we work together? Because I do think, in, particularly in rural communities, we have the transformational power to really be models for that in urban areas where it's, it's much more difficult. Thank you. Um, Ray and Kathy, as, as traditional, um, as, as administrators in traditional public school systems in rural areas, you are having to innovate all the time. Um, 
can you talk about some of the innovations you've employed that are paying the biggest dividends, things that might be replicable in other rural contexts? I think one of the things that uh, we've spent a lot of time uh, looking at is how we can best serve our students in our county. And we're very proud that we've been able to develop uh, what we consider to be a good uh, school choice option within public schools. And I think one of the problems and challenges we have is that the landscape is changing in this country, particularly in North Carolina, but I suspect in other parts of the country too. And, uh, and we have to deal with something we've not had to deal with before. And that is uh, the market share that we have because it's a marketplace. Um, and as Tammy mentioned, uh, parents and students can choose to go anywhere they want now. They don't have to choose the public school. But the problem is, is, is that we in public education and public school systems have not, have been very, very slow to change and we have not changed. And so what we've sought to do in, in our county is to develop options uh, and actually we're in competition with, uh, with Gaston Prep to some extent, but we believe that it's incumbent upon us to give students and parents in our school district options and authentic options. And, uh, and that's what we've done. So uh, we have a early uh, college high school, we have a, a new tech high school, uh, as well as academies in our high school. So we force our students as eighth graders to make a choice. They have to choose what kind of education they want in high school. And we also involve parents. And that's a missing piece that, that happens so often when students make that transition, the parents are kind of left out. Uh, and we've been fairly successful at offering those options and opportunities for, um, um, for our parents and for our students. Uh, but that is the one uh, area that I think uh, public schools are going to have to wake up to is that they are in a marketplace now and that they have to make choices and they have to make changes and that's tough when you deal with institutions uh, like public education. When you speak about barriers and something practical that can be replicated, um, there's so many things that we have to do, so many innovative things because of lack of funding. Uh, but the one thing that I think that can be replicated that we have done, and Blake spoke of it, is changing the culture of the school. Changing the culture of the school. Although we are underfunded, that is a barrier. Although we have limited resources, limited jobs, limited economic development, that's a barrier. And although we have low income students, and that's a debatable barrier. The biggest barrier is fighting to overcome generational mindsets. Those mindsets of families that think to graduate from high school is equivalent to their students or their children receiving the Nobel Peace Prize when the word commencement means to begin. To change the generational mindsets of those students who come from these parents and come from these homes and think at a very early age, I have to learn how to survive, but to teach them and to work with them and get them to understand that they can take conventional measures and pathways to make a living and not just to survive. To change the generational mindsets of the political leaders and the community leaders who's more concerned about test results as, a for, as opposed to transformation, who's more concerned about bureaucracy than the butts of the children in the chairs, who's more concerned about uh, politics over pupils, we can change the mindsets by changing the culture of our school. And when I speak of changing the culture of our school, one thing I do believe, once you impact the students, the students impact their homes, the homes impact the community. So we start with changing the culture, how we greet our students, how we meet our students, how they greet and meet us, how they are to develop some pride about their school. So something that can be replicated, just change the culture of the school. Thank you. I have one more prepared question. We'd love to get to your questions. If you've written a question down on a note card, hold it up and a staff member will come by and grab it. Uh, in the meantime, Sanford and Luzelma, uh, you, you have both and your organizations have both championed different policy initiatives, either at the, the local or state level, in order to spur uh, either access to schools or just uh, progress in rural communities. 
what are some of the policy initiatives that you all have championed that could be replicated in other rural contexts uh, for our participants to, to take back home? Yeah, so I'm going to go back to something Tammy said. Um, we are, we, we need to move away from this concept that we're under competition for kids, right? We really all are about student success. The, you know, I'm part, I'm leading the collective impact initiative in the Rio Grande Valley. And if you would have asked five years ago, Tom would not have been welcomed at the table because of this perceived competition. But Tom sits at the table with you know, representing the 39 superintendents and sits at the table representing, you know, the workforce boards and the kids. We have to move away from this concept that, that you know, that, that we are competing for kids. What we should be competing for is for the most rigorous environments that we can create with the highest expectations that we can create, not only for our students, but for our teachers and our administrators and for our families. Um, and so something that we've done that can definitely go to scale is if you look at Texas, Texas is huge, right? Uh, I represent four counties in deep South Texas that if you go up an hour, you go through a checkpoint to get to Austin. So we are very much, and when I say checkpoint, you're going through Border Patrol, and they're asking you, U.S. citizen? And you say yes, and if you don't look like you might be, they say, are you sure? You know? Um, and so we really are very much in, in, in this little box. So the Rio Grande Valley has an opportunity to innovate, not just for programs, but also for policy, and to scale, because if we don't take care of ourselves, nobody will. If you talk to Dr. Murdoch, the state demographer for the state of Texas, he will tell you, if you are going to be born Hispanic and poor in Texas, be born in the Rio Grande Valley. Because you will outperform, whether you're Hispanic and poor, any other Latinos in the state of Texas. So one way is we have high expectations for our students. So we have 100 and some early college high schools in Texas. The Rio Grande Valley has 33% of them. Two, two of our largest school districts, Brownsville and PSJA, um, are wall-to-wall -wall early college high school. That means that they have the expectation of college for all, for every single student, including they are the, the first district, PSJA, in the state of Texas that actually implemented early college high school in their Sonia Sotomayor school, that is a school for uh, pregnant and teenage moms and the Bill U School, which is a school for boys that are in the last chance campus before they go into the next system uh, that doesn't fare well for them. So I say that it is, I think our greatest policy is the scaling of high expectations for our students and really coming together with the best interest of kids and families um, in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that we, in, in terms of the uh, charter school issue, we've learned a lot from states who have walked this path long before we have. And um, we just got a law passed in 2013. There are two schools in Jackson. Uh, they're going to be uh, four schools eventually. And uh, we're now moving to a place where there will eventually be schools in the Mississippi Delta. And the focus on that is to make sure that we're providing a choice for parents while at the same time having accountability. We have a very strong authorizer in the state of Mississippi. And uh, in fact, uh, Crystal Cormack is a uh, 04 Teach for America alum from the Mississippi Delta. She's on the authorizer, shout out. So, um, so she's one of the authorizers and we've had several conversations about some of the folks who tried to apply and they don't make the cut. So accountability is something that we really uh, focus on in Mississippi. Um, another part of that is to make sure that we're building trust in communities, particularly in the uh, black communities in the Delta, because there are a lot of folks that see charters as a way for our white flight private academies to reconstitute themselves, uh, simply because there was that great split uh, during desegregation and a lot of these private schools in the Delta, for lack of a better term, suck. So um, I mean, they're awful schools, they're under-resourced. In fact, in a lot of places, like you can't tell me the Strider Academy in Tallahatchie County is better than West Tallahatchie School District. You just cannot. I drive by it, they don't even have a D on the building. So um, yeah, so 
those schools are struggling and some people see, oh, we can turn into a charter school now. And because of that, there's a lot of mistrust within the black community. So we are having conversations with leaders just to say, this is for kids. And we're making sure that these schools are not gonna be able to reconstitute themselves. We're gonna make sure that any school that opens is gonna be a high quality school. They're not gonna even make it through the second round of the interview if they're not a high quality school. And then the other part is to make sure that if there are charter schools in Mississippi that are doing great things, we need to figure out what those things are and how do we replicate them into our uh, existing district schools. No problem. <laughs> the two other things that I really want to address very briefly in terms of things that we're doing in Mississippi, uh, we have state-funded pre-K now. Uh, we got a pre-K bill passed in 2013 as well. And the way we were able to do that, because we're a low resource state, so we didn't have enough money to just you know, build a pre-K program, what we've done is use existing uh, resources. Uh, school districts use Title I money in order to have pre-K classes. We have Head Start, we've got some good private child care centers, and what we've al allowed these communities to do is to pro give our districts, Head Start and private child care centers the opportunity to work together to come with a community-wide or a county-wide pre-K plan. So they come up with a plan, this is where the pre-K classrooms are gonna go, they share teachers, they share resources, they share professional development. So we, there are 11 collaboratives throughout the state of Mississippi, we're looking for more resources in order to have more collaboratives and also give our Department of Education the ability to um, be able to provide the assistance that the collaboratives need. Uh, one other thing that I wanna cover is, sorry, uh, sex education, which is a big challenge for Mississippi. We are usually, I usually say we're the SEC of uh, teen pregnancy. We've been number one for a long, long time. Um, Roll time. Long, oh, sorry, man, War Eagle. Um, so what we've done is um, every, a lot of districts in the state of, Miss, particularly in the Delta, are providing sex education through middle school and high school right now. And along with that, we're training teachers, so not only do they teach the classes, but they also serve as uh, places where students can go and they can ask questions to those teachers. We also just got a CDC grant, so now we're working with schools and healthcare centers to make sure that teens have access to teen-friendly health now. So that's another area. It's, we don't talk about sex ed much in ed reform. I want to make sure I included that. Thank you. So a question from the audience uh, to, to whomever would like to answer. How do you solve the problem of recruiting high quality teachers to rural areas? What are the tricks to get great teachers into rural schools? Please don't talk about Teach for America. Let's hear other, <coughs> other things. Well, I mean, I think, I think one of the most basic things is um, start by recruiting teachers from within your community. Um, at Idea Public Schools, nearly 80% of our teachers come from the communities uh, that our schools are in. Um, over 85% of our school leaders are African American or Latino. Um, I mean, this is another sort of the innovation thing. Like, we didn't, we are an incredibly diverse organization, and we never set out with any sort of like diversity strategy. We just wanted to find the best possible people. We knew we were not going to import them from New York City or San Francisco or Houston or Austin or Dallas. So we just went out there and we had to look a little bit harder, but we found the absolute best people and we just invested a ton, a ton in training. And you guys know this. I mean, we talk about structure, we talk about innovation. And we talk about you know um, collaboration and partnerships between districts and charters, but like ultimately, it's all about the quality of the instructional core. And you're you're, you're not going to have a school filled with remarkable teaching and fantastic teachers that is delivering anything less than exceptional results. And you know, conversely, we don't have any great schools at Idea Public Schools that are filled with you know average teachers. Our schools are great because our teachers are great. So I just think you've got to really find those diamonds in the rough in your community and champion and support and really train train, train, train the heck out of them. And I'll, I'll be, you know, one specific thing that we do with that, uh, you know, when you're at our schools and you're teaching sixth grade math, you're the only sixth grade math teacher, and that's true for every subject. So, um, I mean, just a, a, a little bit of thoughtfulness with technology means that every other week, all of our teachers um, across the state are on a one-hour webinar where the best teacher in the entire system is sort of laying out the next couple of weeks and demonstrating some of the best ways to teach. In some cases that might be lining up kind of a Khan Academy class or something else that this individual, that this content leader has found, you know, in terms of like resources. So I, I think those are some ways that we can end the isolation and spread the best practices of our most talented teachers a lot more um, um, quickly. I would say absolutely casting a wide as net as possible and always recruiting. Two particular things we've done and, and one we're just now able to do is one looking within our parent community. 
So finding parents who understand our mission, who deeply get our culture, and then saying, what's the pathway for you to become a teacher? And let's talk about what that means. Maybe that means you have a two-year degree and we need to talk about how we can make that a four. Maybe you have a four-year degree and weren't teaching. Let's talk about how do we give you the support so that you can become a teacher. And that's been a great avenue for us. And the second one we haven't been able to do until recently is grow our own. And I mean literally from the students we taught now are coming back to teach. And I'm super excited that with just three graduating classes, already 15 of our former students are back in classes teaching their brothers, their sisters, or cousins. <laughs> and, and when you talk about how are you going to get and keep talent, it's already there. And while I don't think we should compel any of our students to feel as if they have to come back or they're selling out if they don't, it's our job to say coming home is a worthwhile, amazing option and teaching is something we celebrate and we start by honoring that while they're in, their, in the building so they wanna come back. And I think those two pieces have helped us to diversify, to have people who are from the community and people who are coming back, which is raising the, the economics beyond our school, which again is, is part of why we exist and what we continuously want to do better. Great. I think another challenge is really supporting young teachers, those in the first few years with mentorship and um, doing whatever we can to make sure they have a good supportive environment and are able to do the work they want. I think one of the realizations that, uh, that we see in our district is that uh, teachers really want to teach. They want to do the work. They aren't paid enough, uh, nearly enough for the job they do. Uh, but it's up to us to try to keep them and, do, and to do everything we can, including uh, mentorship, uh, giving them that kind of support, as well as making sure that they have some successes while they're in the field. Great. That's up. Yeah, my, uh, so my father graduated from college in 1968, and when he graduated, he went into education. He taught in the Delta. I had several aunts that taught in the Delta, and the reason they went into education is there weren't other fields. There weren't a lot of opportunities for them other than either being a preacher or being a teacher. Um, when I graduated from college, I could go anywhere, I could do anything, and that has been a major difference in the Delta, where your best and brightest aren't necessarily going into the classroom anymore, they're going off and they're doing, even if they're going into education, they're going into Metro Jackson, they're going into Metro Memphis, so that has been a challenge. Uh, I think in terms of recruiting, or as I like to say in SEC country, recruiting, uh, which I do on a regular basis, I think it's about building relationships, so schools that I've seen that have been successful at this have created opportunities opportunities for potential teachers to come into the building. So either you're coming in, we're doing Saturday school, come in and teach for Saturday school. We have summer school, come in and teach during summer school. You're building relationships with principals as well as future colleagues. So when you offer that position, they've already built a relationship with you. I think that goes a long way. And I think you also have to make the pitch and say, we're trying to build something great here. We're doing amazing things and we need you to be a part of this team. So when somebody's making the decision on what school they want to be at, they say, this is a team that I want to be a part of. So I think that's the strategy for recruiting. Just, just one thing, <clears throat> echoing everything that everyone else has said, but I'm one of those real people. You make them your head football coach, you make them your head baseball coach, <laughs> and you find them a spouse, and then they'll stay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So while you've got the microphone, you talked about changing the culture of a school and the impact that can have on the student and then the family and then the greater community. Can you get even more practical like you just did um, to, to share an example of what you've done uh, specifically to turn around a school? Um, how was it done? What was the impact? What, what were some of the strategies that you employed? Oh my gosh, we do, we do a lot of things. Um, as we talked about the graduation rate of our school being over 90%, over 92% um, ongoing. Um, we were having problems with students in recent years um, starting not to take schools being important. We started Sunset School. I like practical stuff. We started Sunset School that goes from 315 to 615 at night that I did. I did all by myself. Any teachers wanted to come in, great. If they didn't, I did it myself. Those students who were behind academically, 
Um, they got a chance to do um, credit recovery courses. They got a chance to get tutoring. They got a chance to make up, and that was a part of what I was talking about, the dissertation that I did. I turned into a study there, and the number of students, we had a 79% of those students who came to Sunset School, who was at least two classrooms or two grade levels behind, got back on track. And last year, there was a first graduating class of those students that was in Sunset School. That has worked really, really well. Uh, we do a thing now as uh, alumni day where we have our alumni to come back. We don't mind our students leaving, okay, but you know, if they leave, they get to come back and they get to talk with our students. And it was good to see during our alumni day this past fall where students were saying, oh wow, I can see myself going to college. I can see myself coming back and talking to these students. Um, we started a young men's empowerment program, which is trying to uh, at fourth grade, we're starting fourth through sixth grades, before these students get to where she was talking about their last chance, we want them at the first chance to make a difference, to teach them what it's like to be a man, so that when they come up into junior high, they already have been taught. Um, for Tammy, you mentioned specifically a goal uh, for Kip Gaston to impact education in Eastern North Carolina, even outside the walls of Kip. I'm sure this is probably true for you as well, Tom. What are some of the specific things that you're doing, uh, partnerships you're building or collaborations you're working on uh, that would actually raise up both the Achievement at KIPP and IDEA and the surrounding districts? And I, I should add that this question is coming from somebody who's taught in Northampton for three years and isn't necessarily seeing or feeling it just yet. Okay, sure. I think formally and formally. So in for formally, we we applied for a common grant with our local school district and was able to bring in $650,000 to do grants to our high school. So both high schools were able to get shared professional development and technology to put in the hands of kids, but more importantly, the training to go with what to do with the technology, because we all know the technology is not the answer, it's, it's what you do with that. We also offer Saturday opportunities where we do free professional development. So I think you were mentioning that with saying, you know, we're having, we're having, we always have open door policy for anyone who wants to observe, provide us feedback or to observe classes. But on Saturdays, we do professional development sessions. So anyone, whether it's Teach for America or non-Teach for America, has the opportunity to come and do free professional development. They earn CUs, which is helpful, but more importantly, have the opportunity to have a professional development session in the morning. So say, for example, we're teaching close reading because we also have Saturday schools after we teach the strategy it's let's go see that in action because so many professional development opportunities you go to a room like this and you talk about a strategy but we want to talk about it and then see it and then come back together and say what did you see what could we do better and how can you implement that and then I think the other piece is the informal ways in which so many of our teachers are roommates with teachers at traditional public schools and saying, how are you sharing resources informally? There, there is nothing that we have that is copywritten that we don't share. So any opportunity to say, for example, in rural communities, you often are the only fifth grade math teacher in your classroom. So it's easier to say, let's collaborate with other fifth grade math teachers, regardless of what school they teach, let's continuously find ways to make that better. Um, and I think we want to continue to do that and to have the, the conversations become less about you know, all of the preconceived notions of what charter means or what it means to be in a traditional public school. Like all those walls that get built, the, the literal and figurative, prevent us from collaborating. So I think for each side, whether it's a brand new core member or whether that's someone who's been in our building for 15 years saying, let's find ways to work together constantly. What, that doesn't have to be a formal partnership that's created by you know, two people. That can be, let's find ways to, to sit down at Starbucks or whatever equivalent that is and build the best unit for our kids, regardless of what school we work in. What would you add, Tom? What's IDEA yeah. doing to push the needle for the entire system? Well, I mean, I think thankfully we've got Lucelma Canales, who every month gets together every superintendent, every um, leader of the nonprofit community, every uh, college university president, and we're looking at a common set of metrics on college completion, on college entrance, on college matriculation. And she's letting the data speak for itself. And there's always the pushback, well, the Selma, you know, the numbers are off by two or three percentage points. It's like, okay, we'll boost it from 53 to 58 percent. You know, it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, but after she gets people sort of past that, uh, and people start saying, well, I mean, why is idea like two and a half times 
the rate of everybody else. And then people start asking, well, gosh, you know, can we visit the schools? Can we see these bright spots? Can we figure out how to actually inculcate some of this into the way that we do things in our organizations? Um, and then the, the, the second thing I would say is, the really great superintendents in our community have used us as a weapon to unify their boards. Um, you know, the, the superintendent of PSJA, Danny King, when he came into town on a white horse, he came in because um, over half of the school board was under federal indictment um, after an FBI raid. Um, we had six schools in that community. They were bleeding students. They were losing them to idea. He did two things. First, he and I approached the philanthropic community and got them to fund a joint teacher and leadership training thing. But the second thing is he was able to say, guys, you know, you factions of school boards, like you guys are not the enemy. Ideas the enemy. You know, we have to actually get together, we have to produce a better product, and we've got to ensure that we're keeping our best students. And, and every speech I've given publicly in the RGV, I've said, as long as Danny King, this forward thinking superintendent, is in charge of PSJ, we are not going to launch more schools in that community. So, on the one hand, there's kind of the hammer, but on the other hand, there's kind of that velvet glove to shake the hand. And I feel like, um, you know, those are just a couple of examples of how we're trying to, you know, do both. You know, it, it's got to be cooperation, but sometimes you bring people to the table cooperation through a little bit of good old-fashioned competition. Sure. So improving education rates and college acceptance rates is amazing, and we've heard a little bit about it. What's the role of schools and teachers in encouraging students to return post-college to help sustain their rural community? So what's the role of schools and teachers to encourage them to return, or do they have a role? I don't, I don't know that it's only schools and, and teachers. I'll give you an example. The United Way of Cameron County developed an ambassadors program. And they, they don't even pay these, these college students, and they're not waiting for them to graduate from college. But college students are now going not only to the high school, but to the middle and to the elementary schools. And the students themselves have built the, cur the curriculum that says, this is what you need to know when you go from from high school to college. And so the United Way pretty much has let go. The school districts have loved this so much that they have now uh, turned to you Teach, which is kind of a program out of UT Austin, I think. And also their 21st century grants and are saying, well, you know what? Maybe we do need to pay them a little bit of a stipend so that they can adopt the school. So these are all kids going back. And we're beginning to see that the, the alums coming back is the most powerful tool that you have, you know, for college completion rates. Because they, it's like the students, um, you know, in their own lingo will say, we know what we face. We know what we have to especially for first generation students, what we have to do to be successful, because our students are leaving our schools academically prepared, but first generation students of color and you know, low income students, they don't have the college knowledge needed to survive in that first two to three weeks, right? Which is the most critical to help them stay in college. I don't know if anyone wants to. Anyone else? So many of your alums back. I think, you know, even when we began, you know, with just fifth graders, part of the long-term vision was we need to have enough come back so that teacher, as teachers leave, we have a pipeline. So I, I think their intentional moves, of course, celebrating teaching and making teaching a noble profession that people are excited about. But I also think back to the opportunities we provided to have our kids be teachers. You know, as I think about them reading with kindergartners or tutoring across our, our peanut field, it's those moments where they're able to mentor or teach someone else and get that feeling that those of you in classrooms feel all the time that despite really hard days make you really excited to go back and do it better or different the next day. Is It's never too young to have students start feeling that. And I think we think about that now with our middle school students about how many opportunities can they get to go read with our kindergartners or to mentor a younger student. So that that feeling is authentic and something that they remember and want to do, but also see teaching as not you know, the default profession that this is the only job I have, but it's a worthwhile option among many. And I think there's no one approach, but it's, it's infusing that idea in as much of, of, of your day as possible so that kids see that as early as possible. And just the way we confront our jobs, right? Because everything starts with us. 
So if our kids are faced with teachers like, oh my gosh, teaching y'all is crazy, or, or all of the comic, who would want to grow up to do that? But if they have seen teachers invest in their lives and have seen that teaching is really, really fun, and what that's, of course, that's, that's a cool option for kids. And I think you can never start too young with doing that. How do we uphold the dignity of student choice alongside the rhetoric of college for all? And that is, there are students in our rural communities who want to be farmers, who want to be factory workers, who want to be hairdressers. Uh, and at the same time, uh, many of us are saying college is for everyone, even amid rising college costs. How do we square those two ideas? My quick response to that is it's about choice. It's about empowering all of our students with the choice to decide what they want to do. And I would argue that the programs that decide for kids in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade that put them on a college prep track or put them on some other track is not empowering kids to make that decision. And, and kids who are coming in far behind, even in our ninth grade class that don't know how to read, I don't think it's fair for us to say, you won't go to college. I think it's fair for us to say, we're going to do whatever it takes to make college an option for you and then you can decide whatever you want to do and we're going to support you in that path but I think the piece is about all, all of us having highest expectations for kids so that when they have many options in front of them they're not going to college because it wasn't a viable option for them I also I also think that and I don't know how many of you have gone to a farm lately but it takes a lot of brains to run a farm. You need to know how to, how to count. You need to be able to know how to deal and negotiate with someone with a mechanic. I mean, there's a lot of learning. I think it's about helping kids understand that whether you're a farmer or whether you are an auto, uh, you know, an auto technician or a small business owner, um, having that education is important. And so we want the most highly, you know, someone said to me one time, uh, why should we encourage kids to go into automotive when they can do engineering, right? And well, I know some auto mechanics that earn more than engineers do, right? And so, but we do want the smartest auto mechanics that we can get. We want the smartest farmers that we can get. And it should be a choice of whether to go or not, not whether they're prepared to go or not. You know, if you talk to our superintendents, when they chose the goal of all students college ready, all students transitioning to college, all, I asked them, because I came into the job 18 months after the planning, and they said, the choice should be of the child to go or not. It should be our responsibility to put in, in place systems and processes that ensure that all kids are ready when they, ch when they make that choice. We do a <clears throat> graduation mentoring program at our school where our senior class or our, try to start, want to start their junior class, actually have a teacher, not just a guidance counselor, that's guiding them. I heard someone spoke earlier about um, the number of students that were accepted into four-year college. It does not matter, four-year, two-year, a year, whatever. The goal of us is to get those students accepted into college to do those things that they are interested in doing. So we do celebrate them getting accepted. And we have an acceptance wall. And the acceptance wall have all, whether it's two-year college, community college, four-year college, Ivy League, it does not matter. You're going to college, and that's all that matters. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's important to make sure that students have options and, and to honor all professions as being something that's honorable as a way to make a living and not to uh, put students in a mode that uh, if they don't go to college, they're unsuccessful, as well as the military. We have students who have graduated and, are, um, and have chosen, uh, could have gone to any uh, major university, but, but chose to stay at home. And there are some who want to stay at home, uh, but also this young lady wanted to be a nurse, so she went to a community college, could have gone to a four-year university, but that was her, her choice and her option and I don't think we need to make students feel badly about making some of those decisions. 
You know, we, uh, we often ask students or young kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they always tell you, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. My daughter wants to be a superhero right now. So everybody's got that answer. But what we don't ask students on a regular basis is how do you get there? Like, I had an 11th grader that wanted to be a lawyer and had no idea about the LSAT or the fact that you have to go to law school after you get your four-year degree. So it goes along with what everybody said about choice. But if you want to be a farmer, you need to know after I graduate from high school, this is what I do next and this is what I do after that. No matter what career you want to go into, you need to know, and you need to know this before your 12th grade. Like, you need to know this is what I need to do in high school, this is what I need to do after high school. So I think that's what's important. Gotcha. Uh, while you've got the microphone, a quick question. Should district schools have the same freedoms and flexibilities as charters? And if so, how do people begin to implement that change in policy? Yes, <laughs> they, sh they should. That's where we have to move towards. Um, I see it in a couple of different ways. Um, I believe that principals should have the same flexibility over staff, over school time, over your academic program as charters do. I think that's the key to success. Um, I think that I've learned that having a, a wife that went through the Fisher Fellowship and started a KIPP school, I know that it's a lot harder to open up a KIPP school than it was for her to take master's classes at Delta State and eventually become a principal. She had to work. Um, I tried to be as, as supportive of a husband as I possibly could during that process. But I think that's where it needs to go. Like we need to do a better job of training our district principals and we also need to give them the same flexibility. Um, I also see um, uh, a lot of charter schools doing a really good job in terms of recruiting teachers and bringing them in. And also not only providing support for students who are on their way to college, but providing support for students after they go to college. Um, you know, the, the counselors that are provided for, you know, students who are in college, I think that's amazing, and I think that's something that every high school in every school district in the country should be doing. So, yes, to answer your question. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I want to shift gears back to hearing from another um, educator in a rural community. Uh, and this is a, a little bit of a commercial as well. Uh, one of the ways Teach for America has tried to expand our impact in rural areas is the, the development of both the Rural School Leadership Academy and the Rural Principal Fellowship. Uh, and so I wanted you all to be sure to hear from a participant today, uh, Ms. Allison Gay. <laughs> Thank you. Before the end of this year, I hope to give birth to my first child. Yet, as a well-educated black lesbian in America, I unfortunately still have to make a choice whether to leave a job in a place that I'm learning to love or sacrifice my child's early learning because there are simply no options for a high quality education in my southern rural community. Here's where you all come in. There's another option looming in the distance, which eliminates the fool's choice I've already stated. What if a few of you in this room come down to the Delta and in partnership with the community, build an educational option that my child and all children could be proud of? I, like many of you, are in this room simply because of Teach for America. I've been both a core member and a staff member. If it weren't for TFA, I probably wouldn't be in education today. Had it not been for my time on staff, as well as a rural school leadership academy, rural education will be the last thing on my mind. This year, I joined staff at Kip Forest City College Preparatory School because the leaders in my region were intentional about creating an immediate path for me to grow my leadership so that scholars in rural Arkansas could not only compete with scholars in Little Rock, but scholars all across the country. You see, although we are part of this lovely Kip network, we have different assets and needs than our urban cousins. My school leader, Marcus Nelson, who is from the Mississippi Delta, purposely set out to hire experienced, qualified teachers who are on a path to leadership, have experience in the classroom, and reflect the children that we serve. Because of this, our students have shown dramatic academic growth, as well as demonstrated grit and self-control as they persevere and navigate challenging curricula and societal expectations. Just the other day, we had a restorative conference with a student and his mother. And despite the behavioral and academic challenges she knows Jalen faces, her joy comes in knowing that since attending KIPP, he is learning how to read, completes most of his assignments, and has not had the police called on her 12-year-old son. 
At our campus, we have implemented restorative practices as a way to teach students how to respectfully advocate for themselves in an era when many of them question if their lives and voices even matter. It is our vision that by 2029, most of our Kipsters will have matriculated to and through college and into an industry of their choice because of the decisions we are making today. Now, if we're going to really advance educational opportunities for rural children and rural children everywhere, individuals who move to places like the Delta to work must put in the work to become a part of the community. Politicians and lobbyists have to push an agenda that revitalizes and supports business opportunities in rural America. School districts have to allocate fiscal resources that attract, attain, and retain talent who are committed to rural education everywhere. Organizations such as KIPP, TFA, and others featured here today have to begin thinking about the agenda we push on rural communities which stimulate rural brain drain. Yes, college offers exposure and advanced opportunities, and students must have choices about their future. But how do we cultivate more rural, rural scholars to come back to their hometowns in order to keep the town alive and grow another generation of scholars? In six years at our current rate of growth and projected attrition, 4,000 students will occupy our four city campus classrooms, be hypnotized, and be prepared to inundate colleges across the country. In 20 years, if we continue to meet our college graduation goals, four cities' current population will be drastically reduced because of the lack of industry that meets our scholars' intellect. One way to avoid this is to source local talent and train them to become teachers the way Teach for America trains college students. We should be teaching the people of the community to teach their children the way this organization has believed newly graduated college students can. By leveraging the strengths of the people who are fully committed to their hometowns, we can ensure that, we, that hardworking people continue to grow their culture and meet society's high academic expectations with their kids. Now, before we get ready to go, let me tell you about Devin. I love Devin. Devin is probably my favorite student, even though you're not supposed to have one. Um, he has been labeled with PTSD, SLD, ODD, and other diagnoses in the SPED um, acronyms, if you will. Because of the relationship I have with Devin and his grandmother, Ms. Williams, Devin is persisting through school and is still enrolled at our school today. That is a gift that I look forward to every morning on my 45 minute drive to work. Yeah. There's an African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. Where I work, this is more than just a saying. So I challenge all of you, if you want to teach rural or lead rural, then you should come work with me, <laughs> right? You can help Devin, you can help Jalen, and you can help me make sure that all of our scholars have dedicated, passionate people to help get them to and through college or to whatever industry that they choose to go into. Come lead rural. That's truly where the magic happens. Thank you. Perfect. We are slightly ahead of schedule. I'm going to ask one more question. I know that there are attendees in the room who live in urban areas, others who might in the future live in urban areas. How can they continue to be an advocate for rural despite their geographic location? What would you all like to see our, um, our friends and counterparts in urban areas do on behalf of rural kids? Um, well, I'll be you know, super specific. I think that we all need to really band together and ensure that Teach for America continues to place growing core sizes in rural communities. And if that does not happen, we are going to see the talent, which is the lifeblood of innovation and progress, turn off like a spigot being closed. And we cannot afford to let that happen in our rural communities. I also think you have an opportunity to partner. You know, that this, this idea of bright spots, you know, and and being able to share across. There are issues in every school, in every community. It really is about how well they hide it or not, right? Because when you go to Austin, as much as we all love Austin, Texas, it's a tale of two cities. If you disaggregate their data, 
their Latino and African American and poor students, um, they should be embarrassed about. But that the data gets hidden. And so, for example, a way that we are working with Austin is our two collab, you know, collective impact communities are actually meeting together. I just went up, they came down, we're sharing resources and tools. The issues are issues. Students are students, parents are parents. You know, just some communities have more money than others. Some can attract more talent than others. Um, but I think what the urban and, and larger communities are learning is that there's a lot to be learned from communities that have scarce resources about how to innovate, about how to collaborate, about how to partner, and how to focus on a student and how to build community around a student. And so I think it's, it's, a, it's a peer learning opportunity um, and a resource sharing opportunity, I think. I agree with both of those and to stay with the specificity of that. It's you know, because of technology, because of whether it's FaceTime or Google Hangouts, there's still the opportunity to mentor kids. There's still the opportunity to say, how can I connect whether I'm five minutes away or 5,000 miles away? And the same thing with sharing expertise. Whatever expertise you have, continue to share that with. How can I look at your budgets and make that stronger? How can I look at your strategic plan and help you make that? All of that, because of the technology in which we live, it, distance is becoming less of a barrier. So don't think just because I'm not there, I can't help. Because I guarantee you, whatever city you're from, if you reach out to any of us and say, do you need help? We're going to say yes. And if you say, can I do it? We're going to say yes. You know, and if they, you say how, we're going to have a long list. So I, I, I don't think that you should have distance as a barrier to why you can't continue to give back or to share to a rural community. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I want to thank you all for giving us part of your Saturday and traveling to be here. I want to thank you all for being rural advocates. Uh, please continue to do so. A big thanks to those who are still teaching in rural communities, both veteran and TFA alumni, um, and have a great rest of your summit. <laughs>